Sergeant John Fribley Hosier Jr., United States Army, Vietnam. Folks, my heart's crying right now after hearing John's story. It's been in my archives almost 17 years. He didn't make the cut for the first Vietnam film and his story's been sitting there and, I, and it's like a haunting story that I know I needed to share. And as I went back and listened to it, it's just such a moving story. If you like some of the Vietnam stories, you're gonna really enjoy this one and hopefully you can share it with others. John was 19 years old when he went into the army in, in Vietnam in 1967-68. Born in Flint, Michigan. Um, his family was in World War II, um, his uncle, uncles and his father, so a military family, so he loved his country and felt his duty to serve his country. And it was Vietnam and he was drafted, so. Folks, it's just an incredible story. He went, and he wanted to be a paratrooper. He wanted to get in there where the action was. So John joined the military, was sent to the 82nd Airborne, and then over to the 503rd Infantry, which if you know your World War II history, a very famous infantry unit. Then to the 101st Airborne, ended up in the 173rd Airborne Brigade, where he fought as a paratrooper. And he was injured at late 1967 in combat, Purple Heart recipient. Um, also the combat infantry badge and bronze star. John was injured several times and could not go back to combat. So his first sergeant came in one day. He was assigned as a desk clerk. He said, I've had it with this. He, he thought like Radar O'Reilly and MASH uh, sitting at the desk. So this first sergeant put a camera down in front of him. He never picked up a camera before in his life and he became one of the greatest combat photographers of Vietnam folks, as you will see through some of these photos. After the war, John uh, went to college and he started helping those that were suffering from post-traumatic stress, Vietnam veterans especially. Through his traveling exhibit, which featured photos that he took in Vietnam called Through Their Eyes, or Through the Eyes. So it was his perspective as a combat photographer. He did more as a photographer, he said, than he did as a combatant. Over a hundred combat assaults with uh, different regiments, companies, battalions, brigades through his time in Vietnam and he took thousands of photos, folks. When I interviewed him in St. Charles, Missouri, it was May 26, 2007, he gave me a stack of black and white photos that he took, eight by tens, beautiful photos. After this introduction, I, I, I'm gonna put a three minute video before his interview called Faces of Vietnam. It's my tribute to John Hosier. You'll see some of his work and this is just a glimpse of it. But folks, he was right there in the thick of it and I, I just so admire him. He passed away over a year ago, December of 2022, at the age of 75. I interviewed him when he was 60. And on his headstone it says, a storyteller, a paratrooper, and remembered and loved by many. And God bless you, John Hosier. I, I, I wish we could have spent more time in this earth. I know I'll see you soon. I'm a photographer and you did great work. And thank you for entrusting me with your story and with these photos. I also wanna thank Michael and Darlene Sarofsky for making it possible for you to watch John's story. Michael, thank you. We're building your, we're building your brigade, we're building your platoon. And I, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share John's story. Folks, my heart's full. I haven't been saying much about sponsoring these stories, but I do need your help. If you have any inclination to sponsor a story, folks, I would encourage you to please do so. There's information in the video description on my website, LarryCapetto.com, and in the comment section of every video, you can donate to my work. Folks, it's very, very important. We need to keep this going. Stories like John's need to be told if you're being blessed, being helped. Tears, joy, laughter through these stories. Folks, please consider helping, okay? My radio station is also listener-supported at Voices of History Radio. I'd appreciate you helping with that. Coming up on one-year anniversary, and I hope to keep the, the station going, folks. So. But I'm going to stop for now. Thank you for watching, listening, sharing these stories. Again, I can't tell you how my heart has been touched with John Hosier's story, folks. Sergeant John Hosier. And um, I, when I asked him about the Huey helicopters in Vietnam, with tears in his eyes, he said that the Huey helicopters were a gift from God. And so I leave you with that. Watch this story. Share it, folks. Let's rally around John. Honor him. And um, I will see you on another broadcast. God bless you.
conscious, but I'm not camera shy, I guess. It's like, well, I'm me, envious of your equipment. But. Well, tell me how old you are now. Uh, 60. 60. So what year did you go to Vietnam? I went to Vietnam in 1967. So help me with the math. How old were you then in 67? Well, in 67, 20, I, I was 20, yeah. Okay. That's I hadn't turned 20 yet. I was, I was 19. Yeah. Were you drafted? I was drafted in, in January of 67. I went into the military. So you were just out of high school a couple of years? Or? I'd been out of high school and uh, had a job working for Sears and Roebuck and didn't the, think much of the war at that time, really. But I'm sure a lot of your friends were probably going to Vietnam. Did you think at some point you're going to go? Um, well, my circumstances were is, is be, in my teen years, my high school years, I, I lived in four different states, went to like seven different schools. So I ended up from California and Michigan, and the only people I knew with are the people I worked with, you know. So I, I didn't have a real close connection with even the guys that worked in the warehouse with me that were going into military. Um, and I didn't think much of, of Vietnam. I mean, the Belgian Congo had gone on, and, and you know, the 60s was that generation and, and that we grew up in, and, and the, the things in the Congo went on, and the Cuba thing went on, and stuff was going on. All, and you know, the attitude was, well, well, some troops will go over there, kick a little bit of ass, and come home. So I wasn't really worried. The other part is, I grew up in this amazingly patriotic community family, even moving. You know, all my memories, you know, um, from living in Nevada on the 4th of July, you know, the rodeo and the cowboys and the flags and, and you know, on America and, and all of that. And, you know, the veterans riding in the old cars from World War II. And, and we look at all these old guys and stuff and things. And, and there was this aura and the exposure of war that was like, well, the worst thing could happen is you get killed for your country. You got a real, you know, it's it's war to me was John Wayne going up Iwo Jima, you know, playing Sergeant Stryker, and a guy shoots him, he falls down dead, and all his buddies go, oh, that's the way he wanted to go, and stuff. The kids see a movie now, somebody gets shot, their guts fly all over the place, and it's bloody and it's gory, and you know, but in in my mind, I wasn't ready for the things, for the reality of of what could await me and eventually did. Did you, uh, go, where'd you go to basic training at? Uh, <laughs> the reason I laugh is I got drafted in Michigan and I would have ended up in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. I lived in Michigan, but my draft board was in Nevada. So when I got my notice, my brother and I took an old 58 Chevy and we drove all the way to Nevada because I didn't want to go to basic training in the winter in Missouri. So I went to Fort Ord, California. What was your MOS? Uh, originally, you're all infantry. But as, as we were sitting in basic training, uh, a guy came in and he said, who wants to be airborne? And we well, what's airborne? And he says, well, and they show you a movie and it's the paratroopers from World War II and they're jumping out of the planes and they tell you the stories and about the training. And, and you know, these are some of the elite and stuff. And a guy sitting next to me, I just met a couple days before we hit each other's shoulders, and, the, and, and he said, and you'll get to do this, this, and this, and you get to wear silver wings on your chest. And go, oh, big deal, silver wings. He said, oh, you get to put blouse boots on your dress uniform. So who wants to wear a blouse boot? Well, you get 55 bucks a month. Well, we're only making 68. And I said, that sounds good. And then he says, don't tell anybody, you're going to be the guys that are going to get all the pussy. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> You know, and in its humor, um, it was one of those things, me and there's only two of us out of my whole company volunteered. And little did we know they'd take us. Yeah. And we went from there. Uh, we didn't get to leave. Most of the guys got leave. We go, what's going on? And they're sent us straight to, to Georgia. And we went to a place. Fort Gordon, Georgia, and it was called Airborne AIT. Everything was accelerated. Your physical training and the gung-ho attitude and, the, you know, working as a team and practicing jumping out of mock-up airplanes, not, you know, no parachutes or any of the equipment or anything. 
and you got where well, you're with all these guys. So it went from two guys to well, got 15, 20 companies training, but I have I went from two guys to a company that was a team. And then they picked us up in buses and they drove us to Fort Benning, Georgia's in buses overnight. And we got off the buses and it was like nothing counted before that. None of the other training. It's like, here's the footprints, put your ass on them footprints and get your shit together. Screaming and yelling and it's like, oh no, what did we do? This wasn't basic at Benning? I mean, this was something. This, this, right? this is jump school. This jump is airborne jump, jump okay. school, yeah. Okay, so I got you that. So you're in, in are you in the... 82nd, 101st? I mean, you went well, 73rd, but... Uh, yeah, well, when, when, when we were in jump school, and this is kind of what makes this, my experience special, and they all are. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from any other guys. I go through this company in jump school with all these guys. So, and it's only three weeks, but it's, you run 25 miles a day. You run everywhere you go, and you jump, and you scream. And, and some of these runs, you, you got guys from all over. You, don't, you never knew each other before. Some guys fall down and you pick them up and hide them in the middle of the formation so they make it through. And the guy didn't know how to iron his uniform, you help him. And, and you know, you, you work as a team and, and, and it really teaches and installs that into you. It makes you feel special. So there, there's a special unity. When we got out of jump school, it just happened that all of us from my company got sent to the 82nd Airborne Fort Bragg and put into uh, a new battalion. I said, we're, and, and this is in uh, uh, summer of 67. I said, you guys are now part of the 503rd Infantry. You know, and your history goes back, so on and so forth, and, you know, and all of this. And, and so it was, and they were the 3rd Battalion. And they made a battalion size element, roughly 1,100 guys or whatever. Well, I'm part of this. Okay. Then they tell the whole battalion, you're all going to Vietnam. And we're going to train here for a couple months. We're going to take you to the coast, put you on a boat, and you're going to go to Vietnam. And we're all like young, gung ho. We're going to save the world, you know. And this is before Tet and before a lot of the heavy buildup, which was coming just a couple months down the road. Some of the stuff. Um, and I got orders and got pulled out by myself and got sent to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, with 101st. So all, every, everybody I trained with and all these my new buddies, you know, right my, sis, my stepsister at home and that kind of stuff. Um, so you're, you're with the 101st now. Okay. I'm with the 101st. So t take, me, take me into Vietnam um, and what you remember about arriving in country the first time. Um, it was the uh, first week of November, 67, about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, I was with a, a recon unit by then. They come in, they wake everybody up, we put on our summer khaki uniforms, they drive us to the air base that's next to the army base there at, at uh, Campbell. They put us on C-141s and, they, and we go, where are we going? They say, you're going to Vietnam. No, you're going tomorrow or there's a formation hour. It's like, you're going now. Packed up our bags. Uh, Went via Alaska. I think the biggest thing I remember about the trip, and it wasn't a whole lot of fear. There was anticipation, but I remember we parked in Alaska and we had to get off the plane, and there weren't no ramps. You had to climb down the steps and walk to this terminal, you know. And and it was November, and we we're freezing our butts off in short sleeve shirts, you know. And we couldn't wait to get back on the plane. Uh, stopped and refueled in Japan, and flew into Cameron Bay. And my first. You know, you're all looking out the window, and, it, and, it, and it's having never seen, I've seen California coastline from the air, and it was kind of like, hey, it's kind of pretty from up here, you know. There's nice blues in the water and the sky and green mountains and stuff, you know. And it's like, well, I, I almost expected jets to be flying at each other in the air and fighting and seeing explosions all over the place and things. I, you know, we're coming into a war, and there wasn't this anything I identified with a war, except a lot... And then I remember they we were sitting in our seats and they said, welcome to Vietnam, and they opened the doors. And we had to sit in our seats, I bet, 45 minutes an hour. And I remember we couldn't see a whole lot, but the smell just hit me, hit all of us. It was like, what is that? 
you know, what to, and to this day I call it the smell of Vietnam, you know, it's the people and I mean, the smell of the country, of, of the business of the war, and uh, I, I still have some things, I can pick them up and I can smell Vietnam in them. So this was November of 67? November 67. Oh, you're with an elite force, I mean, 101st? I'm, I'm with 260 other guys on an airplane, basically. They put us in Cameron Bay and they have a reception station. That's where people come and go, a transient place. You know, it's, 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 it's like Grand Central Station for the military. You know, guys going home, guys going on R&R, &R, guys coming into country. And they put everybody in barracks. And every morning there's a formation. And it's one of them for me, okay, you're going to pick up cigarette butts, or you're going to, you know, clean this up, or you all have KP, you're all going to have duty or so. But in the formation, they count and make sure he's there. And every morning, they're going, okay, you, 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 and you go with this guy. And that's all you know, they go with that guy. And the second day we're there, they took, like me and about 20 other guys, go, you, 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 and you, and you. What? You're going to the 173rd, and I'd never heard of him. I says, where's that? And they said, Doc Toe. And I said, where's Doc Toe? It's up in the mountains. And it's like, well, I lived in the mountains as a teenager, was a Boy Scout. Okay, see what the mountains look like. You're edit, you'll be able to edit this, course, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I get off track, because I, you know, I, I lead me where you need me to go, You're brother. Fine. You're all right, man. Okay. okay. So okay. as you talk, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, I'm envisioning. Um, I've talked to a lot of Vietnam vets, and uh, I just kind of want to get an idea of what, what, what what was your, what did you do in Vietnam as far as being with the 173rd? I mean, you weren't just jumping out of airplanes, you were no, air mobile? No. Uh, not in the true sense. Uh, everybody was air mobile, it was in combat pretty much. Um, the biggest way we got around was helicopters. Tell me a little bit about the Huey helicopters, <laughs> what they were for, used for, and then your involvement. Uh, oh them. man. They were a gift from God. Um, sometimes I wonder how Howard Hughes could have <laughs> been behind such a phenomenal piece of equipment. Um, I made a couple hundred combat assaults, mostly as a combat photographer. I flew all over. I, I had the opportunity to go just about anywhere I needed to in the Central Highlands for my first year in Vietnam. And the, the best way to get from point A to point B was a slick, which we called the Hueys. And they're different types, and they changed. Um, were you, uh, you were, before you were a combat photographer, before you were wounded, tell me, I mean, did you do combat assaults before? Yeah, that? yeah, I did. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about the pickup, uh, being inserted into an LZ, and just, just take me on a mission, one, one or two that you remember. Um, Hot LZ, whatever, just, yeah. just take me on a mission. I've I got to go with the first time. I mean, the, the, I flew into Vietnam on a, on a great big plane. We, we flew in C-130s to the base camp. The air base was right next to where our base camp was, you know, and on K. We shared it with the first cab. I hadn't been on a Huey. I made helicopter jumps in the mainland, but they were all the Chinooks, which were the bigger ones. So I hadn't been on a Huey. Hadn't gone through the whole thing you see in the movies where your ass is loaded up and stuff. Um, first night I got into, into camp, uh, they put me in a tent with uh, like six other dudes. Everybody got spread it out to different units in this base camp. Six of the other guys that were with me, and we went in there and they hey, you're the cherries, you're coming in. And, and I had got this, I says, hi guys. And he says, don't be smiling, you're going out tomorrow. I says, yeah? And he says, yeah, you're going to the real war. You know, and they start, a couple guys needling us, but look like I was talking to my uncle. They looked different. They moved different. Uh, the, their body language, how they sat, where their eyes went, scared the shit out of me because I didn't understand it. And then uh, 
guy comes up and they made us dump out our duffel bag and gave us a rucksack and they started throwing all our shit in a trash can. I said, what? You know, I'm going to write my mother. <laughs> you carry this shit around, you ain't going to be able to write nobody, boy. You just keep your mouth shut and you listen. And it's like, man, I'm an air, I'm airborne, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm the best in, I'm in prime of my life, you know. And uh, we sorted stuff out and he kind of clued us in on a whole bunch of little bitty things. We had no idea what he's talking about. And we ran out and they told me, they gave me what's called an M79 grenade launcher. And he says, you're the grenadier. And I'd fired one a couple times in training. I mean, it was nothing you really trained a whole lot with. And I knew the principle of it. It's like, I don't want this thing, man. It's one shot, you know, and then there ain't no protection. And, uh, you know, and it's like, that's your job. And that's, that's the job. It's open. It's your job. And we got up and we went to the Hueys. And they're lined up on the on the pads, and we get in it. I think there was six or seven of us a piece, and we got our rucks. You know, and it's like, hey, I, I'm loaded with all this ammunition, and I got I got some sea rats, and I got water, and I got a steel pot, and my uniform's all clean. You know, and I look like I'm a new guy. You know, and I'm fairly clean shaven, and all this, and I get on this helicopter, and they all take off, and the sun's coming up, and it's like. They get in these formations and you start hearing them whipping and the guys and some guys are quiet and some guys are laughing and I just looked out and it was like, wow, this is amazing. It's just amazing. And you couldn't really, you heard a buzz, but it was the buzz of the radios and it was a buzz of the blades and it was a buzz of the guys talking and it was a buzz of the wind going by. But to me, it seemed like it was all just this one big buzz, and I hadn't learned how to sort it out yet. It was uh, the Hueys in a formation, or what? What was going on? It, yeah. Yeah. They, uh, it, it, what we had is we had, uh, we had to have like, uh, we were running four slicks and four formations of four. We were running 16 slicks to a sortie. And um, we're just like, we're way up. It's like really peaceful, you know, and, and we're way up high and you feel like there's nothing and you know, it's, it's like riding a motorcycle in the sky and, 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 and nothing's really kind of going on. You're doing a lot of just thinking like, okay, where are we going and what's happening? And I've heard stories and I've heard this and nobody looks concerned, so I shouldn't be concerned, you know? And I guess we're out a few minutes and Guys start taking and putting jamming magazines and loading rounds. He says, what? And he says, we're getting ready to go in. I says, we're getting ready to what? And he says, we're getting ready to go in. And as we start coming in, up in front, there's a couple, the, the, they were the early gunships, the C-model Hueys. And they're coming down, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, they open up with their 60s. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like, all I hear is bullets. And it's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm going to die today. And then as our slick comes in, the, the door gunner on the slick, he starts opening up and everybody starts moving and I just start following the bunch. And we hit the grass, it wasn't a rice paddy, but it was a field and we hit the grass and it wasn't too high and guys move out and they tell me what to do and you know, and all oh, this is going on and then there's just silence. There weren't no gooks. And uh, everybody got together and moved it in towards the tree line and there was a village not too far away, and we get in a tree line, and before you know it, there's teenage small kids out there selling us cold Coca-Cola. It's like, how do you know we are coming, you know, type of thing. And, and, and I, I looked at the kind of the humor of that.
but the fear was just is overwhelming. You know, I, I made up my mind that. But that was my first combat assault. Was there, you said anticipation, fear, adrenaline? I mean, you get pumped up for these things. I, I'm assuming that after your first time, you got you got more seasoned or whatever, and maybe eventually you look like those guys that look like your uncle. I mean, you were oh yeah, you grew up quick and all. Is there a baptism under fire? I mean, do you feel invincible? And then how does that leave you? <sighs> I bet we all said, well, I can't say that because I heard other guys say other things. Most of the guys that, when we'd be bullshitting, say, it ain't going to be me. So it's always going to be somebody else that's going to get it. You know, it's like, it's not going to happen to me. Um, damn. The emotions you go through that we still carry the things we learned in Vietnam. I mean, it was one of the best teachers we had, and we were at a prime age. And we still carry those lessons, and, and now we're looking at them saying, and, uh, we went to the wrong class, brother, you know. Um, shit, it's all stuff you heard before. I don't know if I feel sorry for the guy who got killed the first day or the last day. Um, yeah, there's a baptism. My baptism was at a point when I realized that it wasn't my war. And I don't mean that negative. I mean, it, it was our war. I wasn't out there alone. You know? I, my baptism was I had to be willing to realize there were other people there that would do things and that I would do things that could either jeopardize or save somebody's life. Um, so do you have an M16 or that it's a grenade launcher? What are you carrying around in the jungles there? I, mean, I, carry, I carried a 45 and a grenade launcher. You guys and, a platoon or a company? Yeah, well, the battalion was broken up into companies, and more often than not, a company didn't work by itself, okay? Uh, they talk on how many troops they had, okay? So uh, you have a company, and a company's going to have four, possibly five platoons. You know, each platoon is going to have four, possibly five squads. Now, if it's full strength, you got... 12 man in an infantry. You got 12 man in a squad, five squads to a platoon, five platoons to a company. In reality, what do you have? You could have four men in a squad. I never saw it, all of them where they all had 12, you know? And I never saw where they all had five squads. So usually you had somewhere, you had somewhere between 20 men and you could have 50. Sure. Okay. Most of the time, platoon would work as a unit. Like, because you talk platoon, you got 50 men, you put, that's 10 helicopters, okay? And so you're committing 10 helicopters to bring in guys in. Now, do you need other helicopters to bring in other supplies? How long is it going to last? You know, what, a, what, you know, what are all the logistics of this crap going on? So a platoon might go in an area and two squads might go up this way for patrolling or you might go this way. Sometimes it's, Somebody calls you and says some shit's going down around the corner. Sometimes you land and it's waiting for you. Um, so you're you're there a whole year, and uh, you told me about your first combat assault. Um, I'm gonna kind of jump around a little bit. That's but, fine. But I've heard in, I've heard in combat there's there's like an adrenaline rush, and you know you're pumped up. All this stuff happens, and then. When the combat's over and it ceases, there's such a letdown, physically and emotionally. Can you expound on that? Is that true? Might not be for everybody. Yeah. Um, the first strong emotion that I think 
First strong emotion I know that I felt during the war, in combat, uh, and I can't put it in one word, it was being pissed off, because we couldn't find the enemy. We wanted a chance to kick their ass, you know. And we couldn't admit they were better than us, because they weren't really better, but it's like, so, the majority of time when combat came, you didn't expect it. Most of the casualties I saw were one form or another of a booby trap. Um, I was a combat photographer. And I was working with one of the units. And I knew some of these guys. And guys rotated in and out. And were two to four yards apart, kind of walking down. It's not, yeah, we're going through an area that is open. Some trails, some rice paddies, hedgerows. And, and all of a sudden, there's this, it was an explosion is what it was, but that's not what it sounded like. It just, uh, there was this loud boom, this bright fa flash, this rush of heat. And it picked me up and blew me about 20 feet, knocked me on my back, and bruised me. killed both the guys behind me. Killed the kid who stepped on it. It was a 105 round. And wounded six other guys, and I didn't have a scratch on me. And there was nobody to There was no way to get back, get even. But there never is an even, you know, it's a war. And then some of us, most of us that survive, go, how come I survived? Who am I to survive? I worked with, I, I worked with a, an idea like that. I worked with a unit and uh, seven guys and I just, happened to go out with them and I like these guys. And I did stories just about letters from home eating chow and being guys, not just the war. Uh, there's a Puerto Rican kid from, I don't know, 102nd Street, Manhattan. <laughs> a con artist and a scammer and a bullshitter and a pain in the ass and he'd get out of every detail he could and he'd steal at cards and nobody liked him. Really. I mean, he, we just didn't like him at all. He's a prick. Had a young kid from Oklahoma. We called him Red. He had red hair. Uh, I never heard him say a bad thing to anybody. Never heard him swear. Somebody was hurt and he was there helping carry their stuff. Red's on the wall. And, you know, many times in my life is why didn't that little prick get on the wall? <laughs> you know, and then I go, that's so unfair. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, but it's like, but I know Red would have said, I'll go. I'll go this way. You go that way. Were you with him when he was killed or? I wasn't next to him, but we were, we were out in the field together that day, out on a patrol. 
Now, now, can I ask you now, you were sure. wounded, you were wounded, and then you started becoming a I, Frogger Chaplain's assistant or whatever? Yeah, I, I was, I was wounded, and, and basically what happened is, is I just got a small scrape, and when I got hit, I tripped and fell down a hill, and so I ended up being shot. It was like you could put a Band-Aid over it, but I broke a couple ribs and stuff and hurt my back. I was in the hospital and they said, uh, good news is you're going to be okay. Bad news is you're not going home. So I'm thinking sometime, I'm thinking, oh, I get to go home. I get to go home, you know. And they sent me back to this base camp, this rear area, which was a pretty nice area. I mean, <laughs> Uncle Sam even built a $5 million whorehouse for us. That's another story. But uh, I got back and... I go back to the company for first sergeant, and he says, well, we're going to try to find you a job. And I said, well, let me go back to the field with my guy. He says, no, you're on a profile. I said, what do you mean a profile? He says, well, they won't clear you because of your back and your ribs. I said, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to be fine. Now we'll find you a job. So that afternoon, they had me report to the chaplain, and the chaplain says, well, you're going to be my chaplain's assistant. And I says, what's that? And he says, you help me with all the services. And I said, what? What do you mean, what, what services? I don't know nothing about God or any of that stuff, really. I mean, you know. And I said, I didn't really want to be a chaplain's assistant. And he said, no, you'll be okay, son. This is a good place for you. And I think, it, I think after the first Sunday, I got fired <laughs> for whatever reason it was. And then they made me a, a clerk. And I said, why, why a clerk? And he says, we need a clerk and you're here. And I said, but no, I'm a soldier. You know, I'm, I'm not a girl, I'm not a secretary. And I had to do morning reports and sit in a nice safe place and eat three hot meals a day and sleep on a cot and I had it really rough. But I bitched and bitched and bitched. Because I want, because all the guys that I went to training with that went across country, went on the boat, came to Vietnam, they're out there in the field. You know, and it's like, those are the same guys. And I, I, I smiled because I was so stupid. But Top got pissed off. He came in one day and he put down sergeant stripes and set a camera down. He says, you want to see the fucking war? You're a combat photographer. I says, what? I said, I don't even know how to put film in a camera. I've never owned a camera. He says, well, you better learn how to load that good because all you got that is that and a 45. You know? And uh, have him report to... Uh, then it was called a public information office. Had a second lieutenant. Uh, called, his name was Gardo. And we used to make fun of him. He's a sh real short guy and hypertensive and scared to shit of the war and stuff. And, and kind of what happened is I had a choice. I could stay in the rear area and polish my boots and put on a clean uniform every day and make morning formations and play their fucking game, or I could go away. And I said, well, I just don't want to be around you idiots. You know, I know what it's like out there. I, I'll be okay. And I went. And I started just taking pictures of what happened every day. And some days it was, and, and, and I'll share these with, Before I describe pictures, I get, but what I didn't know happened is every time I clicked that shutter, I took ownership. And that's what's been hard over the years. Had a, and, and, and they go from, I never shot. First time I had a camera. I'm screwing around trying to learn how to put film in it. It's a Pentax 35 millimeter, single lens reflex. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what f-stop was, shutter speed or anything, but I learned. I shot Tri-X. First time I went out to take pictures, uh, sappers had hit the wire the night before, and then that morning went out there and they're all blown up and just chopped up and, you know, the Vietnamese come where they tried to come through the wire. And I took a couple pictures and then they printed them and I saw them and I just like, nah, this is no good. Um, 
And I never shot anything like that again. Uh, we had a had a guy that uh, see I got a couple thousand photographs <laughs> and a lot of these guys are on the wall and I don't know their names I got the last picture ever taken of some guys and I don't mean lying and dying I mean sitting in a foxhole smoking a cigarette and there's those, and we had a kid from Columbus, Ohio, and his mom sent him an artificial Christmas tree in November 67, and we're out in the jungle, and it's in Jul the first week of July, 68, and he gets this beat up, torn up, all oh, busted up cardboard box with duct tape around and stuff, opens it up, and it's this old Christmas tree. And we took the Christmas tree out, and we put it together, it's about two, three foot tall, we put it all together, and we took shaving cream and we put snow on it and we took the aluminum foil from all of our sea rations and we made Christmas ornaments and it was the 4th of July and we sat around and we celebrated our country's independence and we sang Silent Night um, I was privileged. And it wasn't, it, you know, our, 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 our country went through tumultuous times in the 60s. And I was privileged to serve with and share with the best of the best. And I don't mean the richest of the richest or the smartest of the smartest. I mean, you know, kids, their dads are still sharecroppers in Alabama. Street kids from the cities of Philadelphia, and a farm boy from Nebraska, and a surfer from L.A., and Native American from the reservations up in Dakota. There was definitely a baptism of fire, but it didn't always come under fire. Sometimes it was grief. Sometimes see? it was a letter from home that your wife just had a baby. Did you see We Were Soldiers? Oh, yeah. Mel Gibson movie? Yeah. Can you relate to that combat photographer, Joe Galloway? I, mean, I know Joe. Yeah. I'm not, I, I, I've met Joe 10 or 20 times and I shared some of my work and talked to him, yeah. I don't think Hollywood can really recreate the combat, but still, that movie was pretty good. Did, did that give you, uh, did that portray it at all like it was? Oh, yeah. That was, that was probably the, probably the best movie to depict, um, the war at both our worst and our best. I think our worst because the circumstances caused the loss of so many lives. I think at our best because it, it, you know, it, it's, it's that, it's that idea that we've had in this country since the beginning, you know, that, that it's almost inherent in us. Um, freedom and heroism and symbols of the eagle and Mount Rushmore and, you know, you, I remember, you know, when the TV went off at midnight and they play the national anthem every night. That's still an ingrained part of our country. Um, you know, it's the old thing is, rule one, you, uh, men die in war, and rule two is you can't change rule one. Um... So let me. Okay, you're you're there for a year. You, you, you're going through your tour, combat photographer. Um, how would you define combat? And that's kind of a, a loaded question, but how would you define combat? You know, because the, well, the, the movies miss the smell of war. You know, that's one of the main things missing in war. But I mean, if you had to define combat based on what you went through in Vietnam, how would you define that?
There's a difference between, uh, and, and I'm not trying to beat around your question, there's a difference between battle and combat. Um, most of the time, it's a situation that's unexpected. I mean, it, it's, it's like, Okay. After that first combat assault, and the stories that you hear, and you're actually in Vietnam, you know, you hear stories about kids throwing bombs in restaurants and this and that, and I, I wasn't around a lot of that at this time. I'm out in the field. But the thing is, the enemy can be anywhere and he can attack you anytime. So you're at this high l adrenaline level. You're at this, this, you're at this emotional level, which comes back as post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? You're aware of, you know, your peripheral vision is highly aware. Your sense of sound is highly aware. And this old look that you see in these guys, it's learning to adapt, you know? It's like you don't put aqua velva on the night before you go out on a combat mission, you know? If you're really smart, you don't eat sea rations, you know? You eat organic food or gook food, you know, I mean, uh, and there's all these things and, you, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and one day you're, you're scared to death because snakes are going to drop down and they're poisonous and they're going to kill you, or that on the other side of this mountain there's an NVA regiment. So there's no rest, you know, and even when the helicopter comes out and says, uh, you're going home, there's no rest because that you ain't home yet. I mean it, it and and most of it is up here for most of the time. The thing I I didn't I knew in combat and they run it in your head and they run it in your head and they run it in your head and and when you're in like a somebody fires some bullets or you set up an ambush or there's a small skirmish, okay? Um you get a taste. But when it when it gets in a situation where it gets heavy, where there's a couple hundred guys, and and all, there's all this confusion, there's this idea that you're supposed to stay calm. Okay, you're supposed to keep your head about you, so you know what you're doing. But it doesn't come out that way. It's 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 panic. Now sometimes you're blessed enough where you control that panic and you come out on top. Um, It, it, it must be like a kid that has real bad ADD and he's been bombarded with all these things at once. And it just, it's just too much to handle. And when it's over, when the gunfire stops, um, the smell of the sulfur is there. The, and, and you know you always see where we run over and you know we want to take care of our wounded, but you don't see all the time where you can hear all the wounded Vietnamese dying and moaning and and you know and it's like sure in some instances you you feel compassion other inches let some bitch die other time well, where is he so I can shoot him again but but the thing is is that sound is is it doesn't go away and when that battle's over it's there that night. You know, and it's there for years to come. Those, you know, they don't tell you when somebody gets shot, they're going to piss and shit all over themselves. You can tell a Vietnam vet in the bathroom, especially if a urinal's plugged up, because that, that's the smell. That smell isn't somebody relieving themselves, that smell is somebody dying. Every time, you know, and, and I go cross country and I go in a diner and they got one of them old trough urinals, you know, and it's all plugged up with the cigarette butts and the ones you laugh about and tell stories about, you want to throw up. Because before you can say no, your mind goes back there. And then when that triggers that part of your mind, your mind starts triggering about all of those things. John, tell me about, we're going to kind of digress a bit, tell me about coming home and uh, re-entering into civilian life. I've been to have it described as going from hell back into heaven. I mean, tell me about that readjustment uh, briefly and uh, how that affected you. Um, 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I came home uh, second week of December in 69. Um, my, my mom and dad had been divorced and, and my, uh, I had a half-sister who lived in Southern California, so I went back to see her. And then uh, my brother and some of the friends from where I worked in Michigan. So I uh, uh, went back to Michigan. Um, I'd been a high school dropout because I moved. And I went home and uh, the Detroit Free Press wrote a, an article about combat photographer comes home, put some pictures in. And I was interviewed and they asked me what my plans were and I said, oh, I'm going to get an education. And uh, a guy, a superintendent of schools called up and the TV station and long story short, he said, Do you real, are you serious about going back to high school? And I said, I just went through a war. I got the right to get a high school diploma like anybody else. He said, I want to meet with you. And I went and met with him. He says, well, you got to realize you're over 21 and you're an adult. But he says, I've got special permission from the state of Michigan if you want to do that. So I went back to high school for six months as a high school senior. And when the thing came about, first thing I thought is, yeah! <laughs> Because I had some money and I bought me a new car. I had an apartment. There was all these young, beautiful girls you dreamt about for the whole, you know, in the war, you always thought about the cheerleaders and, you know, and if, I just, if I'm just alive and I can just make it home. And, I'm, and I thought, like, man, I'm being dumped in heaven. And it was hell. It was just because they were all kids. And I wasn't old, really, you know, I mean, they were all the other side of the world from me and the whole experience. I went through, uh, walked across the stage, got my high school diploma, um, and um, went back to work. And I started uh, uh, I didn't do any drugs in Vietnam. I know marijuana was out there and stuff like that, but that was my choice. I was just drank a little beer when it was around. Um, and when I got back home, the states were different than I thought they were going to be. Um, I was still, in my mind, I was still listening to the Beatles sing, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and I came back and songs were out called Back in the USSR. I said, don't tell me Paul McCartney's a commie, you know. Uh, one of the stories that I, I, I like to tell is when I went off to war, there weren't no pantyhose. And I came home and one of the first dates I went on was with a girl who we somewhat liked each other and I went out with her and we were necking and we're kissing and, and we had a bottle of wine and, and I thought, well, I'm going to get laid. And she had pantyhose on and I thought they were some type of new contraction, you know, t -t -t you know, anti don't touch me type of thing. Years later we talked and we both laughed about it, but my perception of, and all the things that had changed in the country, you know, the, uh, the first time I saw All in the Family on TV, it's like, I can't believe they got some long-haired, pinko, faggot, communist, son of a bitch, anti-war, you know, has a TV program and people are watching it. Um, I had a... I guess it was, uh, I'd been out about a year and um, I had one of the muscle cars, a Charger muscle car. And I was driving and my wife was pregnant. And I'm just driving down one of the streets and some guys, I called them kids because everybody were kids to me. And kids come up next to me in a car and they start gunning her engine and stuff to race and I'm not going to race with my old lady and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they cut in front of me and hit the wheels and a rock came up and broke the windshield and I chased him down, pulled a gun out of the glove compartment, stuck a gun in this guy's face. And I looked at him and I said, what the fuck is wrong with you? I looked back and I'm going, I was asking the wrong person a question, you know, but at the time it was like, uh, next day, uh, 
and the police came and found a gun in a glove box and a guy filed out a warrant and I was arrested. I went to court and I talked to the judge. And he asked me if I had anything to say. I said, yeah. I says, you know what, I don't know who my enemies are. I'm just driving down the highway and, you know, some kids, and they'd been smoking pot. I said, man, I, they were smoking pot. I could smell the pot and, and running around the highway. And, and it's like, you know, you ought to be taking their ass and sending their fucking ass to Vietnam. And he says, oh, you, you, I, I noticed you were in Vietnam. I said, yes, I was. And he says, well, you know, you can't bring all of that stuff back here on the streets, causing trouble and disrupting our society. You know, he says, what do I think I ought to do with you? I says, I think you ought to write me a letter of recommendation. Let me go back in the Army. So he said, case dismissed, and I went back in the Army. You didn't go back to Vietnam, did you? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. For how long? I, I started training. Initially, I went in, I started training troops in... 1970. You were training troops? I was training troops in Fort Polk, Louisiana. DI? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I was an assistant DI. I didn't, hadn't been to drill sergeant school, but they sent me there while they're waiting to find out what they wanted to do with me. Cause oh. I, and then uh, somebody saw some of my photographs and I got sent, the Pentagon sent for me. Mm. And I went to the Pentagon and at the time they had a unit at the Pentagon called Department of the Army Special Photo Agency. And they were the top photography agency for the Pentagon. And each branch of service had an office. And it was run by a, a brigadier general. And they says, we like your work. We'd like you to be a photographer for us. And I said, I'd like that. And they said, where do you want to go? I says, where can I go? And they said, you can go anywhere in the world you want to go. And I said, I want to go to Vietnam. And they said, well, we don't have any place in Vietnam. <clears throat> I said, yeah, we got lots of places in Vietnam. So that, that's not what I mean. So their closest office was in Hawaii. And the commander is a full bird colonel and there's 12 guys that work for him. I mean, it was an elite group. And I showed up there and we basically, I got a diplomatic passport and wore civilian clothes and I, I'd fly into Vietnam and fly wherever I wanted and shoot stories and do stuff and fly out. And I did that for about two and a half years. And um, an opportunity came up to be a, a military instructor mm -hmm. in Hawaii at their at their uh, uh, their recon and survival school. So I took that job, did that for a couple of years, and then uh, I went back to North Carolina and I trained special forces and uh, airborne troops in North Carolina. And I got out of the service in '78. We're running out of time. I got to ask you: the first time you went to the wall, tell me about it and how you felt. The Vietnam Wall, or have you been there? Yeah. Can you tell me the first time you went and what, how you felt about it, and why you went? I was predisposed at, at all the publicity and everything about it, and most of the publicity that they aired was negative. Um, a friend of mine. I end up going to college with a friend of mine's son. He's a Vietnam veteran. His son uh, moved to Washington, D.C. as a disc jockey. And I hadn't been to the wall. And I went to Washington and, and I went to see him. And I, said, and I asked him, I says, uh, uh, have, what's the wall like? And been up for a couple years. And he says, uh, well, I haven't been to it. And I said, what do you mean you haven't been to it? He says, I told my dad, his dad had died. I, uh, I told my dad I wasn't going to go to it until you showed up. And he took me. And we went at night. And parking and things were different. We, we, we were parked along uh, the Lincoln Memorial. And we got out and we walked across. And it was before the heart statue was put up. And it just knocked me dead. It's like if you tell somebody there's a, a half a million names in a phone book. Don't sound like shit, but if you have to open a phone book and read all the names, it's like, damn, it doesn't look like there's that many names. 
somebody says, you know, 58,000 people died between 59 and 75 in Vietnam, it's like, well, that's a number, just, you know, scratches on a piece of paper. But when you go there, and you, 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 you have to know that uh, there are angels at that wall all the time. All the time. I've seen, I've seen miracles. People, oh, you're nuts. I'll just take a minute, try this one. In 2005, I, I traveled around the country with the Moon Vietnam Wall. And I set up my photographs and memorabilia and all the stuff I collected, and I had no idea why I was in my grandma's attic and all this stuff all these years. I'm in Oklahoma City. It's a nonprofit organization, but we charge a fee so we can pay for gas and stuff. A little town in Denison, Texas calls me up and says, Hey, will you, will you bring your exhibit down here? We want to celebrate our veterans. We ain't got no money to give you no gas. We can't put you in a hotel room. He says, and, and the old ladies in town promise they'd feed you well. Will you come? I call my wife and I'm supposed to be home and she says, what do you think? And I says, I, I don't know, I'm supposed to be there. Those towns on the Texas-Oklahoma border and, and I set up my display, it's a, a tent in the middle of a football field at the high school and the wall's set up there and there's no trees and there's no shade and it's 103 and 104 degrees and it's July and it's miserable. And, and they even, they were even going to the hospital to get ice, you know, so they had cold water for the people. And it's like, all these plain old folks from all over are showing up, cattle country, on the edge of the cotton country, little towns around and stuff. And it's Saturday night and I'm dead tired. I've been there all day and it was hot and had some, had a bottle of Coca-Cola I had from Vietnam was in a display case. It got so hot I didn't have an air vent and it blew up in my display case. And, but it's about 11.30 at night and, and I have a table. The table's got 2,000 pictures. Three by five pictures are laminated on key rings. So you can sit down and just sit anywhere at the table. I hear a lady scream. I walk over and say, come on. You okay? Can I get you a drink of water? What? Where do you get these pictures? And I said, those pictures were taken in Vietnam. He says, this, this, where do you get this picture? Oh, there's 2,000 pictures. Okay. She sits down at a chair at the table, picks her ring out, picks one picture out of the ring, and calls me over. Tell me about that picture. And I said, well, I was traveling between Anke and Pleiku, and I missed my helicopter because I was screwing around. I was going to get in trouble, so I caught, a, I caught a convoy I wasn't supposed to be on. As the convoy is going up the pass, you can only go one way because they have to have gunship escorts. This is a bad place. As we're going up, we stop along the highway, and there's bunkers at all the bridges, and there's this one bunker, and I got my cameras around my neck, and this kid's on top of this bunker. He says, hey, take a picture of me. Put me in Life magazine. Come on, take my picture. I said, man, I ain't going to get it in life, mate. I'll do it anyways. And he calls his buddies out, and they all come out from under the bunker, and I take their pictures and their dance, and I take about eight or nine pictures. Hey, what's your name? I write down his name and his unit. Half an hour later, get in my truck and go on through with my life. Two days after I took a picture, The bunker was overrun and these four guys were killed. So here it is, 37 years later. Where do you get the picture? I tell her the story. And I didn't know they'd been killed. And she says, I don't have any pictures of my husband. That's my husband in Vietnam. Well, bring him on over here. I'll give it to him. He's on the wall. See, and this is my this is a plug for me, or not for me, for the way the circle thing is going. 
I told people, these aren't my pictures. They belong to you. They belong to whoever's looking or whoever's watching. They're a part of our country. And I've had stuff like that happen. I've been to 80 cities around this country in the last five years. I have people find pictures of relatives or somebody that knew somebody. or And the wall in D.C., it's a place to heal. It's an amazing, amazing place to heal. Let me ask you a couple more questions. We're just about out of time. I, so I want to have time to scan some pictures. I think you brought some pictures. I don't think you brought 2,000, right? No. I don't know if you got them on this, but let me ask you one more follow-up question. Here. Okay. Um, as far as the, the documentary goes, but, um, you know, being a veteran of Vietnam, obviously you're proud to be a Vietnam vet. Yeah. People thank you for your service? Sure, really. What, is, what does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Being a little corny, the, I look at the flag and, and, and I look at what it can represent. We know what it's represented in the past and we each carry that in different ways. It's, it's, it's a symbol. Because it's a symbol, it can change. And, and hey, our country is in dire places right now. Okay. Um, it's a symbol of the hope, the dreams. The, the the truth that's really in the heart of us as as, as a people, and uh, it represents all those things. It's going to be different for each of us. One more question. We just got a couple of minutes, but tell me about freedom. What freedom means to you, and then tell me about the price of freedom. Wow. I talked to you earlier. You know. I, the thing that we grew up with is the worst thing could happen is we could die for what we believe in. I think what might be worse is not to have that opportunity to die for what we believe in. As we've seen through the marvelous people in history, people like Mandela, his freedom is also a state of mind. Um, and one day in Vietnam I saw a kid get shot through his hand. A bullet went in and out and it was a free ticket home. He made a choice. When he got hit he started screaming, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. And he died on the slick on the way back. I have another friend in Northern California lost an arm and two legs. And he's in a disabled Olympics and he helps kids and he helped build the California Vietnam Memorial and he said, I'm never gonna quit, I'm never gonna quit. And he told me, I said, what? And he says, I had the freedom to choose where I was gonna go and what I was going to do with my life. We all do. Well, I, I got to say that um, your story is very inspiring to me. Uh, I'd like to keep going and going and going, but I'm about out of time. I understand. So, but, but I want to ask you to do one more thing at the end of the interviews. I'll ask all veterans, and I hope that's okay with you, from where you're seated. If you saw the end of my documentaries, you'd understand why, but I'm going to ask if you can give me a salute into the camera when I tell you to, from where sure. you're at. If you see one of my films, you'll understand why I do this, so. Okay. And, uh, okay, so right into the camera, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs>